It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this morning's event, Maria Hockfield Sheher, an artist, transdisciplinary maker, working with industrial felt at the intersection of performance art, design, and sculpture. Maria is an assistant professor in Indigenous performance and digital arts, and also a Canadian research chair in transdisciplinary Indigenous arts. She is the director and lead artist of the Indigenous Creation Studio, Department of Visual Studies, English and Drama at the University of Toronto, Mississauga campus. With a grad appointment in the Master of Visual Studies, Daniels, University of Toronto as well. She lives in Toronto and is the inaugural Artworks TO Artist in Residency with the City of Toronto, Parks and Recreation, as well a Mellon Fellow, Center for the Imagination in the Borderlands Arizona State University. 2022. No big deal. Huh? Maria. She has exhibited extensively, including the solo exhibition Nine Years Towards the Sun at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, 2019 to 20, following her first major touring solo exhibition with Monograph, The One Who Keeps On Giving, organized by the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery here in Toronto in 2017 18. She presented her work at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, the Brick House Gallery in Brooklyn, the Bronx Museum, Gibney Dance in New York, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, as well the Panoply Performance Lab, the Montreal Museum in Fine Arts. And she works in private and public collections, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of the American Indian, and the Montreal Museum of Contemporary Art. Her work with industrial felt performance, form, performance forms and present-day materials crosses boundaries and operates at the intersection of Anishinaabe cultural knowledge methodology, methodologies and Western-based art practices. Maria is Canadian like her white settler father and Anishinaabe like her late mother and belongs to the Wasak Sin First Nation, Ontario, Canada. My co-work in the institution seeks to promote accountability to Indigenous people and looks to model new ways of connecting with Indigenous communities through art-based practices and to establish respectful, ongoing relationships with Indigenous peoples, language, and land. Her current research term at the university has three components that function as interventions and sites of learning. Maria will talk to us, amongst many things, but about navigating spirituality as an artist and as an Anishinaabe. And we are so, so humbled and privileged and joyed to have you here today with us, Maria. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Try the mic and see how I feel. So it's really good up here. Okay. Uh, we know the what was equal in the Asian cause, what was changing the them, what's happening in the Twitch club, what's up in that, and it's not very new as I can wish. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, whether I too was asking the question, is this in person or online? Uh, <laughs> so this is one of my first in person speaking engagements. Um, I am teaching a class, so I do have a small intimate class that I work with, but um, yeah, my first reaction when I was invited to come here was, what, me? Like, I work with industrial felt. That's not really a material that is seen as something that's so sacred or spiritual. Um, and in fact, when I started working with it, I was drawn to it for all the other reasons that it's a material that we see in modern art. It's accepted as a contemporary um, art material. You know, Joseph Boyce used it. It's about modern technology. Um, and it 
gave me a freedom to enter into an art discourse without feeling all this other baggage, because art is very much, when you're working in performance like I do, there's this whole other history around um, shamans in the gallery, and so I often felt that I didn't want to um, bring my whole self into the gallery. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few projects I'm working on and some of the um, research I'm doing and share that with you. Um, but before I do that, I also just want to take a moment to also acknowledge this amazing performance. Um, I'm a big fan of the Nook. They're very close with my family. Um, it was a surprise, a delightful surprise that they were here. And I have to say I felt really emotional <laughs> to see them dancing. Um, just because of the strength of who they are. But also that it's very often when we see the grass dance, that's the first dance that comes out for the powwow. That's the first um, form of dance that's sort of, you know, breaking down the grass and also wearing, you know, this connection to, the, to land and earth. And I think that that's significant to think about in this time coming out of the pandemic, a lot of what I know for myself I've been thinking about is how do I walk forward with balance, um, being fully who I am, and including you know all those elements of the medicine wheel. So we have this in the Anishinaabe culture. I'm sure you've seen this. This amazing circle. This medicine wheel. It's a circle that's divided into four sections. And so these four sections are looking at like a compass, the north, the south, the east, the west. And it embodies so much, but it also in those four areas, it's also embodying different parts of who we are. And in that center is, is we're in that center where those two lines cross, that point of strength. We're balancing those all those four areas. In, in academia, we know that so one of those areas is the mind, like the mental area. We know that's part of it. We also know the body, that's the second one, but that's part of it. But those other two areas of that medicine wheel you know, that we balance, those other two areas that connect with spirit and emotion are not areas that are included in our day-to-day -day institution or in academia, which is where I most often find myself, whether it's an art museum or I with tea in academia. And so that's something I have to talk with my students about. Like how do we move forward with balance fully who we are? So as a Anishinaabe Kwe, um, the other thing I have to talk about is because I'm a performance artist. Uh, so I'm really thinking about how I, my body is the art, right? So we often think of canvas and paint, but with performance art, it really is how I move, the sounds I'm making, what I'm doing, what I'm wearing, how I'm interacting. And for Anishinaabe, there's so many great overlaps with um, thinking about oral tradition. So coming from a people where it's not about writing things down. When you write things down, we say you write things down to forget about them. That's for later. But for oral tradition, if you're writing things down, you're embodying them, you're living them, you're keeping them in mind with every action that you're doing. So it changes the way you think about what you say, how you move, when everything you're doing and saying is about embodying a story or sharing that, communicating that with another. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about those intersections around performance that happened for me because um, I think there's so much for myself in my history, this baggage around what happens when I enter into an art museum or when I enter into any kind of institution where I feel this whole baggage of colonial history where 
something like to hear the word spirituality, it's so laden with English associations or Christianity, um, which might be a different sort of spirituality that a, a holistic, like the medicine mill that I referred to, and how um, through action and embodiment and movement, and also through language that um, I'm able to balance that. So the other thing I'll share, so I'm teaching a class called All Our Relations, Land, Art, and Activism. And it really is a land-based class where I take my students out. We go for walks. We um, look at plants. We forge. We you know, do all kinds of things outside. And in the classroom as well. I mean, we have my brother, John, who's coming and dancing showing us some powwow on Monday. So a lot of different um, ideas around this notion of all our relations and how we keep ourselves in right relations with the land, with ourselves, our own balance. But if we think about medicine we on the center, we're in the middle, but then outside of that is family, and then community, and then place, and all these circles keep going. So how do, how do you keep yourself in right relations? At, across all of that. Um, so one of the, the chapters, and many of you may be familiar with this book already, it's by Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer from this amazing book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And there's a chapter in there um, that's called The Grammar of Animacy. And this was a, a chapter, I mean, I love all chapters. But this specifically always strikes me every time I read it, and I always assign it to my class, because what it does so well is using the language of science. She talks about the way that science create when it looks at things in our world as a botanist, right? She's a botanist. That it through the language, it refers to things as objects and not subjects. And she talks about Father Wadmi or Anne Shopping Woman and the way that that language is actually um, does not have gender. And the way that it functions is that things become subjects. So a bay it can be a body of water, it can be a person or a relative or a relation. So um, I want to share this because I think that this is the other part about when I think about being in the natural world, being outside, being connected, that how we see the world and through the languages we use. So I have to think of the, the baggage of English for me happens. But then when I look at it, it's trying to imagine to see the world in a way that everything around us were in relation with it. We're not viewing it as an object. So um, that's a little bit about the language. Uh, and then for that class, that I love to share with my students for that class. Um, so I'm teaching, teaching for my research. And then I'm also making art as an artist. Um, when thinking about using industrial felt, the other thing I've done, and I'm going to share one of the works, an early work that I made uh, called, well, it was just called Jingle Boots. Really simple. So today we saw grass dancing here. Um, there's another form of dance which you may have seen at a lot of protests. That's when it became more popular, which is the jingle dress. So this beautiful dress that has these little comb jingles. And the jingles, they look like a bell, but they don't have a hammer, which means they can't make sound on their own. They need each other. And this is really a healing dress. Um, it's worn in ceremony. It's meant to, to, um, to help with healing. There's so much around it that you can learn. But about over 10 years ago, I wanted to, more than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I made a work which was a jingle dress of the paper. And the idea was I wanted to um, make a jingle dress, but I didn't want to make the jingle dress 
and it showed in the gallery because I thought if I did, I would dance it. And I'd wear it in ceremony, at powers, and community and culture. So I thought if I make it on the paper, um, I can, on each jingle, there's usually you know, a jingle for each day of the year. I thought, well, what if I put the name of the name of author on each jingle? So I'm honoring those voices. Um, so I made this beautiful dress out of paper and put a jingle on each jingle with the name of a name of author. And I thought, okay, this is a way of um, thinking about writing our own stories. This is going for it. So this was 10 years ago. At the time, no one knew what a jingle dress was outside of the name of community. It's this incredible white dress. Uh, made of the paper, it's not the Smithsonian, he's a Native American Indian. Uh, but that was a key moment for me because after that I started to think about, well, what if I wore it? And that was when I started to think about embodying um, and being present and all these ideas around performance and I started to perform. So after that, the next work that I made was this pair of felt jingle boots. And this was a way for me, again, to embody the jingle, the sound, um, without it having to be the dress. And it was also by having the boots, it was a way for me to do that without gender specificity. It wasn't a skirt, it wasn't a dress, it was a pair of boots. Um, and I thought it was perfect because it would, it would make sound, its own sound, it was so soft. Um, but it was rigid enough that it gave the boot structure. So I since learned in Russia they have these amazing felt boots. And I'm like, okay, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that because I'm not from Russia. Um, or the Siberian, yeah, up north. Um, so, but once I made them, I realized there was, I was like, oh, these are really familiar because they look like the liner in the boot that I used to have as a kid. So I had these. Um, Cooper boots or the Sorrells, and there was a liner and it'd get wet and you have to take it out and it dry. Um, and I would wear these jingle boots and I just run back and forth and jump up and down in them. I just wanted to do these repeated motions. And so what I've since learned about this jingle is how connected this is to sound in truth. So there's this word that lands it's in writes about in um, Dancing Miller Turtle's Back, where she talks about the word dead way or truth, um, and breaks it down. Um, so this other Jim Dumont says, when he was trying to translate dead way, he wasn't sure what the translation was. He's like, what is, what's the root of truth, of dead way? And someone said, well, put an O in front. And if you put an O in front, the word at the beginning is O day. Oh, they means heart. So your heart. And then way, or way, way, means sound. So listening to the sound of your heart, listening to your truth of who you are, and this idea of um, being fully who you are, uh, listening to your spirit, and moving forward. I feel like we saw that earlier already, the like dancing. And so for me, that was something I started to connect with the jingle, this idea of truth sound, embodying that through movement. Um, and so now one of the things I'm looking at is how do I begin to, so much of my performances are about what I'm doing, and I'm so busy, I don't necessarily have time to think about what I'm saying. So now I'm thinking more about voice and how to incorporate voice into that. Um, so that's a little bit about some of the performances that I do. Um, when I think about being transdisciplinary, as a transdisciplinary artist, I'm really looking at this idea of um, what I guess we would say, I don't like to use this word now, I think we're thinking of other words, but this decolonial process where art is really broken down into painting, into drawing, into sculpture. And so what I'm looking at doing is saying, well, art is that, but it's also more. It's also about the dance, it's about the prayer, it's about the ceremony. Um, it's also about science, you know, it's also about being on the land. It's all of these things. And so if we connect all of that at the ground and we're 
together, then it can shape up into something very specific. So um, when I'm thinking about transdisciplinary practice, I'm really looking across that. Um, so those are a few elements about what my work is, some of the work I'm doing at the school, but also um, I'm also now been recently announced that I'm the um, City of Toronto Artworks TO Legacy Artists in Residence, and so I'm in the ravines of Toronto. And this is pretty amazing for me. It's kind of blowing my mind because um, right before the pandemic, I moved here to teach at UT, and everything locked down. And so I'm trying to think about, you know, for myself, I was living in Brooklyn for 10 years. I'm from the um, from Lesopsi, which is two and a half hours north of here, so it's this island up by Perfect Sound. And I think here I'm back in Toronto, and how do I feel grounded here in the city? Um, and so, like a lot of people, I started to go up for walks. Um, and now with this residency, I'm looking at these ravines and spending time with this, the waterways and realizing it's not that there's just one river, there isn't just the Don Valley or the credit river, there's all these rivers that are connected like a hand, these veins coming into um, Lake Ontario. And to suddenly be mindful of all this network of water systems that are pulsating around me has been pretty incredible. So I've been uh, collaborating with this artist who's a former grad student of mine, um, Chris Mendoza, who did a lot of research in the Don Valley. And we've been doing this crazy thing where we are walking in the river, in hip waders, in the Don Valley, upstream, and just spending time literally in the water, thinking about being in water, by water, in Toronto. And I have to tell you, getting outside has been incredible. Um, because I, being from a place where there's so much water, um, it feels natural to be there. I want to put it on my face when I get hot, and like, okay, don't do that. Yes. I don't know what's going on with this part. <laughs> but just being there and realizing there is this river, and then also getting a, a feel of what that river bed feels like as well, and being connected to, you know, seeing um, a heron that's there, or seeing a raccoon, or being bitten by mosquitoes, like really getting a sense of not only I'm a part of this, but I'm also connected to it. So it's been incredible to um, get to know Toronto in this way. So we'll see where that takes me, but we're continuing um, you know, every Sunday to go for these walks and these insane hip waders. Um, just been pretty incredible. So the other, the other thing I'm working on right now, so I'm continuing to do that. I'll be doing a performance. Saturday um, as a, a performance with Chris through Pumice Raft, um, where we'll be at the Dog Valley performing. Um, but I'm also working on another performance with a longtime collaborator, Electric Chain, which will happen in New York, August 6th. And for that, this performance, I feel like I just want to mention it right now because I didn't realize the connections with the today's topic in my own practice until I really thought about it. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this performance and it's called, it takes its title from a, a Bucky St. Marie song, this old Bucky St. Marie song. And the song says, um, God is alive, magic is afoot. And the title for this performance that we're, we changed it a little, we're calling it Spirit is alive, magic is a foot. So I was like, okay, wait, I, can, I have to do the talk because I am dealing with spirit. Um, and I realized that this is something that both Jen, or Electric Jen, um, that when we collaborate, we do, we are, I'm like, really drawn to her because she does these electronic, um, she has a keyboard, she sings, she has a really, she's always surfing, but she's really zen, she was, they were really close, like she's totally like this kind of hippie person. And I'm like, why am I so drawn to working with her? And it's and I and even when we start, we do this thing where we face each other, and we look at each other, we close our eyes, and we just breathe. 
and I realized that when I'm often performing on my own, I'm like, okay, let's do this, and I'm so anxious, and I have all this energy, but with Jen, we perform, she really grounds me, and I have to read, and I slow it down, and I take my time, and she has those, you may have seen these, or are you really familiar with them, these incredible um, glass bowls, and you can like hit, make these sounds with, so she'll be doing that, um, so I'm excited about that for one. So I'm thinking again about a lot of different intersections around having to remain grounded and perform, but embodying that and being balanced in all that I'm doing as well. And so in that way, the felt, now when I think about it after the pandemic, I'm realizing that in many ways it's become a sort of, on one hand, I, could, I wasn't able to work because I was thinking, um, I think it's connected to trauma. I think I'm doing this as a way to shield myself from like feeling trauma. And about, but now I've come to realize I'm like, no, now that I'm not using it, I'm like, it's also a sort of shield. And it's, it is neutral in some ways, but it also it's protecting me, but it's also allowing me to protect myself in the way that I want to. So it's. Um, in another kind of way, although I'm like, do I feel comfortable saying that it's a sort of like, yeah, uh, not a talisman, but does it have this kind of other resonance for me that's enabling me to continue to work with it in a way that is connected to spirit and what we and all this? And I think so. So, how am I for time? Is it time for some Q&A?